about a year ago, I was at a conference and um, amongst railway folks and uh, a Gartner thought leader, Mark Riskino, piped up and said, you know, you've got to be careful that your business doesn't get infected by Moore's law. And I'm going, well, I come from an IT background. What is, what, you know, well, how did you bring this back to, how did you land this one? And basically, sort of forced me to go back to what is Moore's law? Moore's law is processor speeds will double every two years and price will halve. Okay, so that's quite a power law in, in place. So that means you're going to get massive efficiencies. And we've seen that play out in the IT uh, world over the last 50, 60 years. Moore's law was promulgated in 1965. And um, I sort of wondered how does this apply to the world that we live in? Well, we have a, we have a Dr. Habenkamp was kind enough to point out that there was a, there's a case study to this in the US. And in the US, they took away 40% of the track and they doubled the volume um, of freight that they moved. So they doubled the density. Ah, that's Moore's law in practice. So that, unfortunately for, for me, kicked off a year's worth of intense study. Uh, a lot of conversations, a lot of debates, uh, a lot of unpacking, some of it later until yesterday afternoon, uh, kindly with uh, a long-time mentor of mine. And this is the result of that conversation. So uh, those conversations, that reading, that studying, and this is what I'm trying to figure out is what happens when railways get infected by Moore's law? And how do we prepare for it and how do we embrace this change? Because it's, kind of, it's happening to us, you know, just to be clear. And I talk about us as suppliers and customers and participants and observers, policy writers. It's us. This is, this is a team game. This is happening to us whether we want to or not. It's not asking for our permission. It's, a, it's like a tsunami. Something happens and the wave is coming at you and you can either take out your surf forward or you can be washed away. Then the other fabulous word that I love is uh, <laughs> disruption. So, you might find that I'm not a particularly keen user of buzzwords because I think they're overused, I think they're overplayed, and I think it takes away proper understanding of what uh, technology or changes in our world actually translates to. So for me, I try to look at uh, what does disruption mean? And one of the words in one of the previous cases came up about with that, which is Uberization. You know, it's a big buzzword. Don't buy it. I just don't. Um, I think digital transformation, disruption, all of this is fundamentally just a business transformation. It's back to basics. There's technology behind it. Technology has advanced. Moore's law, by the way, was when it was announced by uh, Jeffrey uh, Gordon Moore, he said, maybe in 10 years this law won't be applicable. Well, I mean, 53 years later, it's still very much applicable. And IBM just said they can extend it to 2030 by making three new chips. Okay? So we, we're in the Moore's Law world, and what does that mean? So for me, disruption is far different than what people are describing it to be. It's not an app. It's not a, another cool thing. It's not digital ADHD. It is radical changes to businesses. So businesses are, that are being displaced, and we, we use different examples. Uber is a good example. Uber isn't an app that's cool and got you from point A to point B. Taxis were using terrible tariffs. They weren't where you wanted them to be, and they weren't, in South Africa's case, they're unsafe. So, that's how the disruption happened. Airbnb. Airbnb isn't yet another app or a company with a lot of rooms. It's a service that provides you the convenience where you want, the price point that you want. Customers are moving there because it's just better. Amazon.com. Um, <laughs> fabulous one that I like about this one is people use them as a good example. They, they are a very good example, and they write a lot about what they do and how they do it whether it's their leadership, whether it's how they do IoT, how they do web services, they are really a very sharing, enterprising company. They were started in 1994. So they're not a fourth industrial revolution company. They're the first digital revolution, the first information revolution company that's transitioning into this fourth industrial revolution. And they went with convenience and customer experience. It's easier to shop with them regardless of how you get to them. It's easier than driving to a place where you get another grumpy service attendant that's not going to sell you what you want and not going to give you a price that you really can afford. Netflix, one of my favorites. Netflix came into being because of late fees by blockbusters. Corner, the shop, uh, corner shop, DVD shop, they were shipping, posting, FedExing DVDs to companies way before streaming was even viable. So late fees, crap customer service, enabled Netflix. That's what brought them into being. And lastly, Spotify, Apple Music, 
they're doing major disruptions. They're back to basics. They are giving you the songs you want, where you want them, when you want them. You don't have to buy a full album because there's one, one that really only has the last track in the album that you really want to listen to. Um, so that's, that for me is disruption. It is radical changes in business that is happening because guys are focusing, surprisingly, on all five of those examples, they're focusing on the customer. But no conversation we be in rowers would be replete without some bad news. And yes, we have some truckers in the room, but this disruption has already happened. So the good news about the bad news is you don't have to wait for it. It's here. It's done. In South Africa, the total uh, freight that's gone, going on to uh, rail is between 15 and 30 percent. So it was between the DOT and Dr. Hoffenkar, they're debating it. It's fine definitions, but the bottom line is we're arguing about 15 percent. So let's agree on 70 percent. 70 percent of freight rail addressable market share is on trucks already. So it's happened. Now, in North America, the same thing happened after the Staggers Act. Trucks got um, a large market share. And the railways fought back, and they fought back, and they have arguably, I would say, have won some of these battles. And some of these battles they won is not because they're looking at the trucks as the enemy. They're looking at the customer, saying, "What does the customer want, and what is my contribution to the supply chain that makes this a viable offering?" And again, quoting a phrase uh, from the good doctor, "Insert yourself into the supply chain." You cannot insert yourself in the supply chain if you're not the responsible participant, which is delivering what customers want, when they want it, where they want it, the price point they want. What's the revolution I'm advocating for? So I'm clearly uh, passionate about this. I come from a, only 17 years of experience, which means I'm a junior in the room, given some of the uh, grades in the room around us. But this has given me a path that take, has taken me from consulting through to uh, technology, through to railways, through to supply chain logistics, I think we're at the place where we can make a real change. We, can, we really can put our heads together and make a real difference. And for me, the good thing about railways is we've been through all of the industrial revolutions. The first one we led was the innovation around the steam engine that we were one of the primary beneficiaries of. Electricity came along, we had electric locomotives that got introduced. Where applicable, where the cost of energy comes into play, they came along and built massive railroads. That's pre-Status Act in the US case. Third industrial revolution got the CPU introduced, and most importantly, I, I do want to stress this, I'm tired of this concept of digitalization. We've been digitalized for 50, 60 years. It's the same as IoT. IoT is scale at scale, and at speed, and it's super connectivity in real time. It's just, it's rebranded old stuff, we've done this. Fourth industrial revolution, and the guy Point the frame, Professor Klaus Schaub said, we're at the start of this. So, and Nick didn't say it, we're in agreement on this, and there is no fifth industrial revolution, stop it. Just stop it. There isn't one. We're at the fourth, at the beginning of it. So we need to understand what is that, uh, how, where are we in that, how do we always respond to this, and what do we need to do to prepare ourselves? Here's a railway revolution, in my mind, arguably one of the finest guys um, ever to have run a railroad. The only difference is he's run three class ones in America. There are seven. He's run three of them in his lifetime. He's passed away. South Africa, as was pointed out earlier to our, our Professor Rod, we've had similar thinking about what this guy did. And what this guy did is fundamentally say, what is the sweet spot of what railways do well? And how do you build a railway, organize a railway to deliver on that value proposition, which is running a scheduled, low-cost railway that's environmentally friendly over long distance. No truck can keep up with a train that's running well. It's no debate about the trucks, and we'll see some of the examples I'm going to use. Trucks are leading the innovation. This revolution, for me, is at its beginning. It's, again, uh, uh, harking back to the old guys, Jeffrey Moore. He's famous for writing a book called Crossing the Chasm. And this is how technology gets adopted. This hasn't changed, by the way. This, he, he did it in the 60s, 70s, if I'm not mistaken. This holds true from how steam engines were adopted all the way to how the Hyperloop will be adopted in the future. And innovators, early adopters, then there's this gap, there's this holding pattern where people take the, uh, time to come to grips with it, prepare for the revolution that they're about to embrace, and then they make the jump. That first effort is about 18%. That's roughly where we are today. And I think 14% of people are aggressively adopting fourth industrial revolution principles and gearing themselves up for it and jumping. But 
the rest of us are waiting. Trains typically are very late to this game. We are very close to the lag majority if we're not the laggards. At the moment, I will say we're laggards in the third industrial revolution. What I'm trying to advocate for is to let go the other way. This is where the, the 10 rules were brought up, as Guy Kawasaki will say. I, at least now you know what you're in for. If you want to catch a nap, you know, you know how far you are from the last one, but there are only 10 rules. And they're fairly simple, and as far as possible, Peter and I spoke about it. I'm going to try and avoid using technology at any particular time. This is about thinking, it's about a mindset. These are the things that I think we should be embracing. Uh, Simon Sinek. People don't buy stuff from you because they're great, they buy stuff because they like what you do and why you do it. So start with why. Define your why as a participant in any particular market. Now, these are front and center, liberty, equality, and um, fraternity, French Revolution. Well known, well understood. Just do it as Nike's one, Starbucks, we are hot into it. Very simple. You understand what you get when the, you go to those guys, and they keep delivering on it. If they, you lie that promise, if you don't get that, that this satisfaction, you move on. For me, um, there's a, case, a quick case study that I will use, which is one of my favorites, and I'll get it out of the way so people won't blame me that I favor Apple. Steve Jobs came back to Apple in 1997, and he defined Apple's why, and it was think different. So he defined it, he wrote a manifesto, which is the here's to the misfits, and I'm not going to let you give, it, give you guys the text, I'll share the text with everybody afterwards. But argue, the, the point that he made is, this is what we stand for, this is why we do what we do, and this is how we're going to make a difference. Now, a lot of people put a lot of Apple success to Steve Jobs or to design of this, that, and other. I don't think so. I think this defining moment for them was, coming back to Apple, he said, this is why we do things. So from 1997 to this year, the company went from a three billion market cap to a trillion dollar market cap. So the, the why drove them through this cycle. Seventy percent of that value was created after Steve Jobs died. So it's not about Steve Jobs. It's about the systemic reality of grasping what you stand for and why you do things. So people buy Apple devices, computers, whatever next, because they buy into the why. As simple as that. My view, and this is supported by science, thank goodness. Um, so the difference between emotion and reason is emotion leads to action. And reason leads to conclusions. Now I think we must move away from the, the conclusions. We know what's wrong. We need to do more on rails. Very simple. We got that. But why? And the argument for that one is, for me, equally simple. Railways ignite economies. I think uh, Jack mentioned that earlier. So that's really, for me, the, the, my definition of why, have you put it out to the crowd, what do you think of the why of a railway should be? Second thing, love your customer. So for those who can't see it, that's a bunch of flowers you throw at your customer. Customer pays for us to be, to do what we do every day. So if you love railways, love your customer first. The rest is secondary. You cannot have public spats with your customers because your ego can't allow you to make peace with it. If you're not delivering on a service and they can't rely on you, they're going to make a choice to move away from you. They're going to feel unloved and go somewhere else. So for me, loving your customer has to be the driving force about what you do next. And uh, Ranja Gulati is a professor at Harvard, had a fabulous way of defining it. So the four characteristics that you need to have to be customer-centric. So it's a truism. We all say we're customer-centric. So what does it come down to? So firstly, Humility. Secondly, uh, empathy. Thirdly, curiosity. And fourthly, and this is the important one, is sense of urgency. Now, for me, that you know, being custom centric immediately with those qualities you set yourself up for success with the fourth industrial revolution. Those are all qualities that you need. The command and control style of leadership is dead. It's not going to survive the way of the future. You are living in a non-linear asymmetric, chaotic world. People are going to be scared, people are going to be afraid, they're going to be clueless, including yourself. You need a different form of leadership. You need level five leadership, as Jim Collins calls it, leader, leader, as uh, Stephen Covey defines it. You're going to need a different kind of leader. So, leaders need to step up to the plate and become humble, humble, caring people with a fierce resolve.
Rule number four, culture eats straight up strategy for breakfast. Now, this, this is a double-edged knife. Um, I'm using the PwC quote there for a second, and I'll move on to another definition, just so you have that in the back of your mind. This has a double meaning. Sec first meaning is, a bad culture will undermine the best strategy ever. It's just what it does. We used to call it, I think the exponent term was the invisible hand. Um, you can call it whatever you want, but it exists and it will kill you. The one I like a bit better is uh, CLG. It's a company, a change management and learning company in Canada. Uh, they say cultures and patterns of behaviors that are encouraged or discouraged by people and systems over time. They defined this in 2000. They did it at the Canadian National Turnaround, and this was a formerly state-owned railway that was privatized going through a listing process and the terrible operating performance metrics. Hunter Harrison employed them despite not believing in consultants, and he was proved wrong and accepted that. But this is the culture that you need to establish is to have people doing the right thing even when nobody's looking. If you have to be monitoring people, if you have to at worst, deploy technology to make sure people are doing their jobs, you have a major problem. Um, culture has to be front and center, just after leadership. And I challenge HR departments to really embrace this. Either insert yourself in the change process, or you're going to be left behind. You know, the HR term, human remains, it's becoming truer than ever, unfortunately. Number five, outcomes is the killer. Okay. So everybody goes into this digital transformation area and said, I'm going to develop an app, I'm going to do this, it will be this cool thing, back to my digital ADHD. And frankly, nobody cares. And I say this not, uh, I say this because I've experienced this myself. I can bring the coolest technology to the room. If it doesn't give the business outcome that the business needs, nobody cares. So make sure that people, that you offer something to people that they really want. If you need to carry iron ore to the sea in rucksacks because it's cheaper, more effective, more reliable, do it. That's the outcome people want. They don't care how you get it there. If it ends up to be a drone, heaven forbid, do it. But the railways, as an active and responsible participant in the supply chain, needs to figure out what are the outcomes they're delivering. I, leading up obviously to a, a, a point being scheduled, reliable, clockwork operating of a railway is the killer outcome. Because um, if you look at sort of one version of looking at where the value calculator is, is looking at the one axis of what's something that you have that's unique and what's something that's valuable for, valuable. Um, as <laughs> a person gave this to me, he said, save you a couple of hundred thousand rands so you don't get the consultant to tell you this, but you want to be top right. The one thing that you do that's really unique that people think to be valuable. In railways, that's moving very heavy things over a very long distance cheaply. So that's where you need to be. If you do it on a scheduled basis, they'll give you more money. And we'll talk about that in a second. But good processes consistently deployed in a healthy culture gives good outcomes. But if you're doing something that's cool and it's no value, nobody's going to buy it. Nobody's going to care. If you're doing something that's high value but it's not unique and they have options, they will choose differently. Trucks have done, showed that to railways, unfortunately. So, the killer app is precision railroad. Scheduled railroads is what used to be called 20 years ago. Keeping your full time appointments like clockwork. Make a promise, stick to the promise, save your ratio. That's what you want to do. This is Hunter's definition is it's a schedule that's constantly monitored for every asset, enables the railway to track progress and optimize wagon and locomotive utilization, gives the customer the, customer the ability to better plan for shipment arrivals and uh, departures. Currently, we don't do that in Southern African railways. Railways is as and when service. It is not good enough. I mean, I'm not picking on the heavy oil guys because they, they have an easy life. They run a very long, very big, uh, expensive conveyor belt. But on general freight, we're not there. We can gloss over it, but we're not there. So, how do you do that? Well, you need to focus on the five things that make railways work. And again, I, as I said, I defer to the North American model on this one. Firstly, customer service, one of the earlier rules. Control your costs. Not cutting costs, control costs. Um, around this one, a particularly key part around this is we talk about maintenance. I think Jack mentioned it earlier. We capex the hell out of everything, we opex nothing. Um, cost containment is critical, but it's not cost cutting. You cannot 
cut maintenance on a railway line. The, the wheel rail interface is a nightmare. It is a perfect storm, it shouldn't be happening, we should be running it on maglevs, but we don't. The heavy stuff needs to run steel on steel. It's a terrible, terrible interaction. So you cannot cut maintenance, it's just going to lead to an exponential disaster later. You've got to optimize your asset utilization. Old business thing. We have railways that run, have the same number of locomotives as Transnet has in the US with three times the turnover. With the same number of staff, it's productivity. Assets are running hard. They're running half the trades per day, by the way, to do this. So they're doing something right. We need to look at asset utilization. Safety, non-negotiable, always, all the good railroads that are know. Safety is from the inside out, it's, it's non-negotiable and safe operations, it's been proven in, in the fabrication industry, it's been shown in the steel industry, if you start with the safety at the heart, you typically get great operational savings as well. And lastly, valuing, is more important than developing, but valuing employees' contributions. And in this particular case, um, this is a fleet reduction, they cut the fleet by 40%, but they had 40% more freight, that's productivity. And this was done 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, in the, in the sort of tail end of the digital, first digital revolution, the third industrial revolution's end, this is the basics that they deployed. We're not there yet. We need to get there. Seven, become a limit all. Um, Microsoft's uh, new CEO, Satya Nadella, not so new anymore, famously in his book, Refresh, refers to uh, uh, an extension of Caroline Dweck's uh, psychologist concept of fixed mindset and growth mindset, he said, everybody needs to become a learner at all. We don't know what we don't know. The immense amount of information that's coming at us is going to require new skills from every one of us. It's going to require skills that relates to what we do every day, new interactions. One of the things I recently did, I read a book on decision making, which means you cascade into psychology. Well, it's very far from my reservation, I'm trying to pull it back, but psychology is what we do every day. And that's why, uh, what's it, uh, Kahneman and Thaler, both, uh, one is the economist, got a, uh, sorry, one's a psychologist, actually got a, a Nobel Prize for economics. Why? It's applicable. Money flows because people make decisions. And by the way, remember the science? Science says you make a decision on emotion. People with lobotomies are decisionless. They are perfectly rational, perfectly capable people, but they're not capable of making decisions because they can't feel. So, Psychology is a critical part to get people on board to come along with the journey. Rule number eight, deliver on innovation as if your species depends on it. Now, we're under threat as a rail industry. We are under threat by autonomous trucks, electric trucks, autonomous fleeted trucks. So we're talking eight trucks running with a single driver across the, the breadth of America. And they're doing it at uh, an energy cost that is about a third of the same. There are fewer handovers, so you have far less um, cost contribution to it. So it's a very efficient, it's becoming a very efficient way. And in America, the, uh, trucks are going to be cost competitive at 500 miles an hour. Now that, for us, is a, should be a heart attack city. That was one of my epiphanies in the last year. Trucks are going to be competitive at 500 miles, 750 k's. That means we're out of the game with GFB, unless we do something radically different. So my advice is, you need to be. You need to have a sense of urgency with your innovation, whether it is technology, whether it's process, whether it's approach to business, style of business. Fail fast, fail often, but fail forward. We learn through failure. We don't learn through success. Again, psychology supports that. If you don't fail, you won't learn. So if you create a culture where it's unsafe to fail, you are going to fail. Ice. Ice 1.0. Live in a cold city, wait for the uh, lake to freeze up, cut it up, put it on a train. Ironically, it's first industrial revolution, trains in the background. Second one, ICE 2.0. We now can put a factory in a warm city, it's comfortable to live, cut, put the ice in there, put it in a cooler truck, and ship it to customers. Guess what? Bring the ice factory home, so you have like the computer, <coughs> personal chiller, you put a you put it in a fridge, you have a fridge in your house. This year, you have self-cooling tins. The cool drink is kept with no energy costs. You open it up, there's a chemical process, the, the uh, tin is cool. That's 200 years, those are vast jumps of innovation, big leaps. It's big bets, big bold bets. It comes through good learning, good understanding. 
Rule nine, strategy, daily, tactics, quarterly. Strategy is what you need to do to meet your objectives based on the correct problem. So define your problem correctly, plan the work, and then go to war. Uh, the guy on the right, the knock his guy with a suit, uh, actually known as Colonel 42nd Boyd, the father of the Udalu, the bottom left. Very limited combat experience, but his thinking about combat came from studying people from Sinsu, Shaka Zulu, Bonaparte, the Boer commandos, and um, Second World War leaders. But these guys would say, plans don't spark contact with the enemy, but planning is essential. So for me, strategy is only valuable once it becomes executed. Tactics are little processes, sub-processes. You, you drill them, you get them understood, but you can change if, you, if the environment changes, Commanders change daily, by the minute. It's strategic decisions. You need to be on top of it. You can't set the strategy for a year and hope it's going to be a attack at the end of the year. Trust me. Minute one day when it's over. Connect everything and unleash the always potential. Just connect everything. Just know what you know. Know what you don't know. And that's got to be, make sure everything's internet connected. Make sure that everyone's got access to the internet. Make sure that people have the devices and the capabilities so that you can learn what you don't know about your system. But this stage is too disconnected, it's too fragmented, it's not integrated in the environment. So lastly, to wrap up, why bother? Well, there's something urgent happening. Our economy is in, in, in the dog box. We're four, four times below the global growth rate, and we, for the first, for the longest period of decline since 1945. There is for me is the urgency. Everybody needs to chip in, everybody needs to do that, but railways have a very key part in that. Fundamentally, cost of logistics at 12% and up. We're competing against guys that have it at 8%. Second thing, it's important. It's important for the sustainability of the railways to become hyper-competitive against them in the market that they play. It's not, it's not any more nice to have. It's not you can't run an unscheduled railway and just hope for the best. It's not the way it's done. And lastly, it's actually quite rewarding. So why waste the perfect storm? Get yourself ready, become revolutionary about how you approach these things, and let's turn the turn the railway industry around.